Hello, in this PowerPoint, we're going to go over the different type of truss bridges. As you can see, here's two examples. There are four different basic type of truss bridges. Uh, number one, as you can see, a basic Warren truss bridge. Um, as you can see in the little picture, it looks like a W, and that's why, you know, you can remember it as a Warren bridge. Your second one is your basic Pratt truss bridge. Um, third one is basic Howie truss bridge. And as you can see, the Pratt and the Howie are kind of flip-flopped in a way. We'll talk more about the compression. And your fourth one is your basic K truss bridge, which you can tell is a K truss because it has a K inside of it. The first bridge we're going over is the basic Warren truss bridge. The Warren truss uses an equilateral triangle to spread out the load on the bridge. This is opposed to the Neville truss, which uses isosceles triangles. The equilateral triangle minimizes the force to only compression and tension. One of the main advantages of a Warren truss is its ability to spread the load evenly across a number of different members. As you may know, members are little lines you see on many diagrams or the depiction of the actual beams of the bridge. Uh, this is, however, generally for cases when the structure is undergoing a span load or a distributed load. This is the diagram of the Warren truss bridge. As you can see, the blue lines are compression and the red lines are tension. Uh, you know this is a Warren truss bridge because of the distinct W it usually makes. This is also one of the simpler ones. And as you can see, some real world examples can be on the train tracks, which they hold a lot of weight. The second bridge we're going over, it's the basic Pratt truss bridge. The basic form of Pratt truss includes triangular truss designs whose diagonal members slope towards the center of the bridge. When under load, this design makes diagonal members feel tension, the force that expands the object apart, while vertical members feel suspension, the force that pushes objects into one cell. One of the advantages is that it is easy to construct and it has a solid choice for a model bridge design. What makes it so good and gives it it's an advantage over the Howie Trust, it's how it spreads out the force when under a load. This diagram is for the Pratt Trust Bridge. Now the Pratt Trust Bridge, again like the other bridge, the blue lines represent compression and the red lines represent tension. Now the good thing about the Pratt Trust Bridge is that it could support a lot of weight in the middle section which usually allows for like heavy traffic, and if the cars are there, the bridge of course will not snap in half. The third bridge we're looking at is a Howie truss bridge. A Howie truss is a truss bridge consisting of cords, verticals, and diagonals whose vertical members are in tension and whose diagonal members are in compression. The Howie truss was invented by William Howie in 1840 and was widely used as a bridge in the mid to late 1800s. This is the reason why it got its name Howie truss. Now, you see that it was invented in the mid to late 1800s. This is one of its advantages because it is cheap on materials and because of the way it is built, it requires less expensive materials like iron. Now, this bridge made really good use of the wood it used and it was good because it was available when it was built. This is the basic Howie truss bridge diagram. This looks very similar to the previous one we saw and it does look flip-flopped and it is, in a sense, because the tension that is zero is in the middle now, rather than on the sides. Now, this causes a problem because this bridge sometimes cracks in the middle, and that's how it mostly breaks. But, um, again, it is stronger on the sides, which makes it a reliable bridge. And like we mentioned before, it was a cheap, and it works good on materials. The final bridge we're looking at is the K-Truss. Rather than just looking like K's, the K-Truss design was a variant from the Parker Truss design. This idea of the K-Truss is to break up the vertical members into smaller sections. This is because the vertical members are in compression. The shorter a member is, the more it can resist buckling from compression. Some of the bridge advantages are that it is more economical, it can go under more pressure, and it is more appealing to the eye. This is the final diagram for the K-Truss bridge. Nothing has changed, and blue is still compression, red is tension, green is still zero, which means there's no force being applied there. Now, the K-Truss gets his name because of how the beams are shaped to look like a K. If you see there's a K, there's another K, there's a line straight in the middle, and there's an opposite to other Ks. Again, this could extend while the bridge is larger, or these could shorten and just be two Ks on either side, depending on how large the bridge is. If you're particularly interested in any of these bridges, these are the resources I used, so you could go ahead and look for yourself. There's more information in these websites and I highly recommend you looking at them.